been coming to welfare in 2012 and 2016. They're spending 125 million a year on mitigating things like the bedroom tax in providing the Scottish Welfare Fund for people in crisis. Now, in essence, that's just taking 125 million a year and sending it back down to London because we're having to mitigate what they're doing to us. If the Scottish government invest in creating jobs, in helping people get businesses started, the tax from that goes down the road. The, the job seekers allowance is saved by down the road. It doesn't come back to the Scottish Parliament. You need a virtuous circle to actually change the substance of your country. Because the biggest driver of ill health, and we've talked about Brexit and the power grab, the biggest driver is poverty. Every single condition you talk about is worse in people who are facing deprivation. And in children whose early lives are affected by poverty, they suffer from more mental health. We lose in the UK 1,400 children a year before the age of 15 as a direct result of poverty. That's the equivalent of a secondary school roof collapsing on top of them every single year. As somebody said when I was involved in an inquiry into this, if this was a toxin, it would be banned. And yet we are allowing 1,400 children across the UK to die every year, to die of premature birth, low birth weight, suicide, addiction, car accidents, house fires, all of these things are associated with deprivation. And if we want to change that, if we want Scotland to have a fairer and healthier future, it's going to have to be on our terms. We're not going to get that out of Westminster, where decisions are made because there's people have shares, because people have a financial interest in a certain decision. It's going to have to be that we take control. And that is the call to all of you. We have to get started. I get sick to death of people talking on social media of, we need a date. When's a date? The next campaign won't be two years long. Think back. Remember how long it took you to get your group set up? Remember how long it took you to get your first leaflet printed? If you wait for a date, we've missed it. If this isn't about when the referendum comes, when we have independence, it's about why. And you have to be getting out and talking to people, whether that's on the doorsteps, your friends at work, your colleagues, your neighbours, your family. And we need to just nudge people gently. You don't need to harangue someone for an hour to try and move them from no to yes in one fell swoop. You're trying to move people one little step along to maybe open their mind to think about, well, I, I, I voted no, but actually now you say that, maybe I'll have a wee look at it. That's what we're all trying to do, is to nudge people along that path. Because we are coming to a fork in the road, and it is critical that we make the right decision. So be polite to people. Be gentle. This haranguing folk on Twitter Yes, you might be having a great time having a slanging match with one person who's talking absolute nonsense. But there's other people who are watching that and think that's how you would speak to them. It achieves nothing. It converts nobody. It's face-to-face -face discussions that will change people's minds. Talk to people about the thing that's important to them. Do they use the NHS? Are there children at university? Are there children living in Europe? Do they depend on a care worker who comes from Poland? These are the things. Talk to people about what we are approaching because we are approaching that fork in the road. And we have to recognise that there were people who voted no in 2014 because they thought the status quo was the safe option. It looked like the big, brightly lit motorway, smooth surface, lots of lights... Independence looked like a country road full of trees. I'm just not sure about that. Somebody knocked on my door and told me if I voted yes, I'd get no pension next week. How many of those stories did we hear? So understand why people voted no. It's not all because they are utterly wedded to the United Kingdom. It's because we didn't convince them or we didn't reassure them. 
We also have to accept there will be people who believe in the United Kingdom the way we believe in an independent Scotland. So you just have to accept that. And not, there's no point in wasting your energy, there's no point in being rude to people. But people who voted no because they were afraid, these are the people that you have to talk to. Or they voted no because, ah, well, that seemed the obvious decision to take. Because maybe they got bored with it. Because they maybe didn't read enough. Because last time there was a status quo. This time there isn't a status quo. It's simply a fork in the road. And down one path is the upheaval and uncertainty of Brexit. And down the other is the uncertainty of independence. Both of them involve big change. But in one, we sign up to be in the boot of Theresa May's car with our finger on our lips, with no voice whatsoever in our future. And in the other one, we climb into the driver's seat and we make the decisions of where we go. Now, we've been, we know that Ruth Davidson doesn't want us to have uh, any future independence referendum. That goes without saying. And now this week, Richard Leonard has said exactly the same. So they're clear. They want Scotland to have no choice and no voice. And we need to get to talk to people to get them to realise that it's critical that we have a choice. We cannot be dragged over the Brexit cliff with no input, not being not just not at the table, but not even in the room. Scotland needs to have a voice. And Scotland absolutely will have a choice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philippa, for a rousing and, well, first of all, a very, very informative chat and, and uh, putting in order all the issues of Brexit and the NHS, which I think will be very useful on the, on the doorsteps and so on, but also giving us a, a rousing call to arms in terms of, of uh, fighting the next referendum. I'm sure she's going to be happy to answer some questions from the floor. Can I ask who wants to speak? Bob will come round with a microphone. Yeah. <coughs> come on, don't be shy. Hello, Paul. Peter Corn. Th thanks very much for that talk. And I found it hugely informative. I now know things that I didn't. And they're beyond even my worst fears <laughs> uh, for the NHS. I, I may be misinterpreting your, your latter part here, Philip. But you say we're approaching a fork in the road. We've been approaching a fork in the road since June 24th, 2016. We're at the fork in the road. We'll be at the first scheduled EU summit mid-October, which is going to fail in its objective. And we're then catapulted into the emergency summit, which was optional but is now certain in November. And that emergency summit is the last chance saloon to do a deal from, because as I understand it, from then on, we ride on a rail of wholly controlled EU procedures through December and January, and an EU vote that requires something like 20 countries representing 65% of the EU population to vote in favour of moving to a transitional period. So we're at the end of the, we're at the fork in the road. We cannot afford to talk about gradualism, and we cannot afford not to talk about the referendum, because the thing that shifts people and shifts, energizes the yes movement and grabs the attention of the media is a campaign set against a deadline for a vote. We can do all the well-intentioned campaigning on days like the 29th of December. It will never have the urgency on the doorsteps and force people to the point of decision. I think we're almost running out of time. Well, I, I think we are almost running out of time in the sense that, um, you know, we're talking about March next year is, is Brexit Day. But I, I disagree that you can't campaign, that you can't get drive going, that we shouldn't be active, that we shouldn't be knocking doors until there's a date. Because I think the longest the campaign would be would be six months. And I can tell you, if Nicola got up tomorrow and said, right, okay, 
the referendum is in six months' time, we'd be struggling to be ready. We actually have to be ready and be active before that date is called. And while you're saying I totally understand that you know it generates more interest, it generates more urgency, but you were saying it generates enthusiasm among yes people. Well, I'm sorry, we should be enthusiastic because we believe in it and we see the urgency of doing it. What I've been told by uh, a senior person from the, uh, that I've met kind of within the diplomatic corps from one of the uh, European countries was that they would take Scotland in out of transition. That isn't an issue. I hope that we will have called the date before Brexit Day so that they know that we are not leaving and therefore they do not accept either our oil, our fish, or anything else being traded for some trinkets for the City of London. If we're not ready four years after the last referendum, all the arguments and have our structures and our strategy and our tactics in place, what the hell will it take to make us ready? But it's we need to get on with it. You are ready. You need to go out. We need to be talking to people. I just don't understand why people are saying... We need a starting gun. We don't need a... Yeah, and so go on with that because it's converting people one at a time. Face-to-face conversion is the most successful. We know that we were often talking to an echo chamber last time. We know that the media wouldn't cover the stories that we wanted them to cover. We're gonna, that's all going to be the same. So it's actually talking to someone who knows you and trusts you but was unsure the last time. And that's the way that we will get the change. And we therefore have to get started and not be waiting for the First Minister to say something. Nobody's waiting. Yeah. We've been doing it constantly. Yeah, well, that's great. That's all I'm asking for people to do. But there are people who are sending me things on Twitter or whatever else going, we need a date to get started. We, no, I disagree. We don't need a date to get started. We're, we'll agree to disagree on that one. Hi, Philippa. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right, I think what Peter's saying is when's the Scottish Government going to kick in? Everybody here, there's, there's people here that are out canvassing every week. Uh, there's people at the Yes movements going, they're going to different rallies. They'll be there again on Saturday. They've been to Inverness, they've been to Bannockburn, they've been to Glasgow, Dundee. I think what Peter was saying was when's the Scottish Government going to announce something? I have no idea. No, I mean, I I simply don't know that. I mean, it's way above my pay grade. I'm not in Holyrood, and uh, Nicola doesn't kind of share that with me. So I don't know. I understand why she's trying to hold her nerve, because the problem is, is you jump too early, and there'll be people say, ah, you see, this was all just an excuse to go for a referendum. Yeah, and, and, and And I disagree with that. I wouldn't like to be the person who's trying to make that decision, I think it's quite a hard decision to make, to get the timing bang on. But moving people, and that's brilliant if, if folk are already out knocking doors and talking to people at work and talking to neighbours, that's critical. The rallies, frankly, are for us. The rallies are to show us we're not alone. The rallies are to show that we haven't gone away. And they hopefully energise people. But people who are going to the rallies, and I'll be at the one in Edinburgh as well, but the people who are going to the rallies then need to take that energy back and actually be doing something on the ground with it. There were lots of people who were social media warriors in 2014 and thought they were doing a brilliant job converting people. But they weren't. They were actually debating with the same people that they were debating with every night. It's absolutely... And if you're out knocking doors, that's brilliant. If you're talking to people at work, if you're organising events, that's brilliant. But our events have to be public events. We have to be getting people into the room, whether it's women-friendly cafes, cafe, coffee and conversations. We need to be getting that we're talking not just to ourselves. Uh, that wasn't my question anyway. Sorry? <laughs> that wasn't my question. No, but you asked when the I Scottish just, Government, I but I don't, I no, don't, just, know, I I don't know when that is. Oh, sorry, you have a different question. Uh, yeah, but what I was... What I was going to suggest uh, was what you said earlier on about Holyrood uh, and about after Brexit, obviously, if Scotland doesn't go for independence, I mean, you're talking about asset stripping. I mean, I've said it to people, and I said it, I even said it in the Kay Adams programme three years ago, 
they'll shut a hole they're down and you're certainly not going to shut it down but technically they are they're mm -hmm. going to strip everything from it they'll be as well shut it down well they won't shut it down because they know it would bring